The third character is Sir Robert Mark, who, as London's top policeman, was on a mission to clean up Scotland Yard and get rid of every corrupt detective. A bent detective harms the whole fabric of public confidence in the police. And so far as I'm concerned, uh, he will always be a prime target, and he can look to no mercy at all from me. The last of our iconic figures is Sir Robert Mark, who became Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police in 1972. Faced with evidence of widespread corruption, Mark pledged to purge all bent detectives from the force. With my colleagues, I have set out to make virtue fashionable. A bent detective not only is himself a, a wrongdoer, not only does he do irreparable harm to a body of men who little deserve to be discredited in that way, but he harms the whole fabric of public confidence and the confidence of the courts in the police. And so far as I'm concerned, uh, he will always be a prime target and he can look to no mercy at all from me. Mark had been Chief Constable of Leicester when he was first brought into the Met as Assistant Commissioner. He said later he was made to feel as welcome as a leper at a colonial governor's garden party. He found Scotland Yard a secretive Masonic place with its own inbred culture. The plainclothes detectives of the CID looked down on the uniform branch and it was in the CID that corruption had been allowed to flourish. In a sting operation, the Times had exposed detectives faking evidence, taking bribes and blackmailing criminals. And just as Mark took the top job, the people produced a damaging splash story. It said the head of the flying squad, Ken Drury, had shared a Mediterranean holiday with the Soho porn baron, James Humphreys. Humphreys had picked up the tab. Ken Drury stood down from his job, protesting his innocence and claiming he'd actually been in the Mediterranean looking for Ronnie Biggs, the great train robber. It's no good going to the Vicar's Tea Party and trying to gain information about the activities of organised teams of robbers. If, uh, if these teams commit high, highly organised crime, they will spend uh, certainly a lot of their pros on the CID. Mark, who was to become known as the Lone Ranger from Leicester, had begun his campaign with a meeting of his top detectives. He told them bluntly he wanted a CID that caught more criminals than it employed. There wasn't even a discussion. This was an entirely one-sided meeting. It was said that you actually walked out. Indeed, but uh, this was simply because I told them exactly what I wanted uh, them to hear. Uh, and then left them. I think he overstated the case, if I might say so, having been uh, an aiming point as to where he was, because I was a, a CID officer and was a career CID officer of 22 years in the Metropolitan Police. John Stevens was to rise through the ranks and eventually himself become head of the Met. When Sir Robert said, basically, all the CID are corrupt, that was, in my view, wrong because I was not corrupt, and I knew a lot of my colleagues and friends weren't. But I think he said that in order to get some effect in terms of what he was doing. There's no doubt that it was corruption at the highest levels and through some of the structures in the yard. What did you think the position was, and what did you propose to do? Well, I thought the position was that um, the misdeeds of the few and their apparent immunity uh, was harming both the reputation of the bulk of the CID and of the force as a whole. And that I was prepared to do anything that was necessary to correct that. It's been said to me that you threatened to put all the CID officers back into uniform if it was necessary to correct that. Well, I don't regard that as a threat. Uh, I looked upon it simply as a managerial statement of fact, which I would have been perfectly prepared to implement. Mark's prime target for reform was the Flying Squad, which he saw as a force within a force, ever keen to promote its image as the Yard's heavy mob. The Flying Squad, they're a fine body of men, they're dedicated, and to do their job, they've got to permanently associate with people of the criminal fraternity. Robert Mark saw it rather differently. I simply said to detectives, of course you must mix with criminals, but the criterion you must adopt is that you must mix with them for the public good, not for your own personal profit. 
We filmed with a team from the Flying Squad, keen to be seen as the Sweeney and proud of their underworld contacts. Most Flying Squad officers have their own informants, and this is the way we work, strictly through informants. That's to me, fact. there's no other way to work. The team was led by a detective inspector. How do you think the criminals regard the Flying Squad? I think with a, a fair amount of awe. How rough is it? Oh, it can be a bit rough sometimes. <laughs> Mind you, I've got two wrestlers on my team, that can't be a bad thing. They're good, good strong boys. They're my bodyguards, personal, you see. <laughs> His good strong boys were Detective Sergeants Mick Howell and Fred Cutts. They were proud of their easy access to the sleazier parts of Soho in search of information. What is he about? Very quiet. Howell and Cutts also had entree to secret Chinese gambling dens. Although Robert Mark had brought in reforms designed to cut back on the Flying Squad's close contacts with the underworld, the two detectives routinely drank in pubs used by what they called the villains as their way of finding out what was going on. I think the policeman and the villain gets on very well. We've got something in common which is unique. We think like each other. He's looking for ways that he can't be arrested and we're looking for ways where we can arrest him. At the end of a hard night's drinking for business, the team relaxed. But Robert Mark feared that the Flying Squad was always in danger of swallowing its own mythology and behaving as if it were a law unto itself. What do you say to those detectives who've said to me that you are more concerned with catching bent detectives than you are with catching criminals? Well, I should say they're right. Um, and I see nothing improper about that. I, I tried to explain to you that I believe that the effectiveness of the criminal investigation department does not depend upon mystique or hocus pocus or any of the nonsense that you've read in these fictional autobiographies over the last uh, decade or two. It depends on effect, that effectiveness depends basically on professional skill and training and then on integrity. Corruption will always be there. It's endemic. It's a matter of how you control it, which is the important part of it, and allow it, if you allow it to grow, then you're in big trouble. And Sir Robert Mark was all about ensuring that it was kept to the limitations that it was, because it's around, the sums of money that are around, and the temptations are always there. But because the CID were always dealing with what I would call very convincing corruptors, those people who will make it their business to actually try and corrupt police officers and bring them in close and, if you like, groom them. And unless you're actually aware of that, unless you've got a structure that deals with that, and also you've got a very strong anti-corruption branch to deal with that, which what Sir Robert Mark introduced and was one of the first to do that, then if you don't do that, you will have problems. Mark's new anti-corruption branch called A10 ended the CID's traditional system. A10 branch. The CID alone would no longer investigate corruption charges against its own officers. A10 was run by the uniform branch, although most of its staff were detectives who would listen to complaints against police from the public. And consequently they arrested him and charged him with uh, threatening behaviour, mm -hmm. two assaults and uh, criminal damage. And the officers that have arrested him are six foot and as wide as an house. And it's ridiculous, my brother's only five foot two weighs about nine and a half, ten stone. In the flying squad, A-10 was not popular. They called it the Gestapo and claimed they now had to look over both shoulders at the same time, one for the criminals, the other for A-10. Their views were shared by the man who'd been running the CID until Mark took over. I'm afraid I'm left with the impression that the whole of the CID uh, have been sort of blasted, the tar brush across their face. Why should police officers uh, uh, have to think that uh, there's a sort of spy network watching them all the time behind their backs, checking up on them? They are honest, straightforward men. And when they're working these long hours and when they're facing dangerous criminals, they expect some support from their senior officers. They don't expect to have pins stuck in their backside. It had to be done. If you actually had the CID investigating themselves, I don't think you were ever going to get to the bottom of what was going on in terms of corruption, and particularly the dirty squad, as they were referred to at that time, and some of the senior officers involved in that. Of course that had to be done. 
The Dirty Squad was the Yard's nickname for the Obscene Publications Squad. Their job was to rid Soho of hardcore pornography, and they were umbilically linked to the Flying Squad. The biggest single inquiry undertaken by A10 was into powerful allegations against senior Porn and Flying Squad officers that they were effectively running their own protection rackets. Sir Robert Mark gave me a fulsome endorsement of the work of A10. I should think it's probably the most effective organisation for investigating internal wrongdoing created by any public service in this country. Inside A10, its investigation into the links between Scotland Yard and the porn industry was kept tightly secure. It was alleged that the top CID men were in the pockets of the porn barons of Soho. Ironically, Bill Moody, the head of the Dirty Squad, had himself been hand-picked to work as an A10 investigator. But when the porn baron James Humphreys was arrested, he claimed that Moody was one of 40 Dirty and Flying Squad men in his pay. Humphreys' wife, Rusty, supported his story. He did pay thousands of pounds out to these people. I've been there on occasions when it has been paid out. And this flat, my children can tell you, it's been like... Union Station at a Christmas time, people getting off and on trains. It's what my husband calls fun day. My husband didn't corrupt the police, they corrupted him. They come to you for the money, you don't go to them. Humphreys himself claimed that Bill Moody and other senior CID officers even organised their own sales of pornography. He said that materials they'd seized in raids would be loaded into an unmarked car and driven to a Soho car park. Humphreys would arrive there in his Jaguar where he'd pay the detectives half the market price for the pawn. I had a flying start, you might say, joked Humphreys. When Robert Mark and his top team received the results of A10's lengthy investigation into Humphreys' allegations, the commissioner took dramatic action. In a dawn raid, Bill Moody was arrested. He'd been head of the Dirty Squad and worked for A10. Also arrested was Ken Drury, the Flying Squad chief who'd been on the Sunshine Holiday with Humphreys. And the biggest fish of all was Commander Wally Virgo, who was in overall charge of both the porn and flying squads. Humphreys claimed he paid Virgo £2,000 in cash every month. Throughout the morning, cars brought the arrested men to Cannon Row Police Station, in the shadow of the old Scotland Yard building where many of them once worked. Some, like Kenneth Drury, former commander and head of the flying squad, hid under blankets on the back seat. So too did Alfred Moody, formerly Detective Chief Superintendent and head of the Obscene Publications Squad. Wallace Virgo, retired commander of the Yard Central Office, was accompanied by his wife. All three top CID officers received lengthy prison terms for corruption. They were among the 600 police officers who left Scotland Yard prematurely during Robert Mark's five years at the top. Many of them had been under investigation and most were what Mark described as shotgun resignations. I think Sir Robert Mark must have gone through hell because he went through some very, very difficult situations in terms of the top team. But as time went on and as I watched his portrayal of policing and his, he came behind and supported the CID after a period of time because he had to, because he knew how effective and how important it was to policing London, then I got to respect it. Don't forget this situation lasted from 1879 till 1972 and I was like a surgeon who had to cut out a major cancer without killing the patient. In other words, I'd got to do great execution amongst the CID whilst at the same time maintaining their morale and to some extent maintaining public belief in them. Of his reformed flying squad, Mark says, I don't know what they do to the enemy, but by God, they frighten me. Sir Robert Mark and the three other characters in this film are now dead. But all four of them live their lives in primary colours, compared to most of today's public figures who are pastel shaded. <laughs>